My, my name's Alex. I'm from Lee Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK, specifically at Lee Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And I'm going to give you an idea of what we've been doing with Open Nebula within the Scientific Computing Department. So what am I going to talk to you about today? I'm going to give you some background on the STFC, the Scientific Computing Department, and then the cloud project that we're currently undertaking. I'm going to give you a run through the different use cases that we have, self-service VMs, bursting our batch system into our cloud, and various other projects that we've got with different communities. Then I'll go for the work that we've needed to do to achieve what we want from the use cases, and then the work we've got left to do. So a nice corporate slide to begin with about what STFC aims to do for the UK. So what is the STFC? It's one of seven research councils which allocates funding in the UK. It's a huge multidisciplinary council. We provide a lot of different science skills across the UK and internationally in physical, life, computational sciences. We've got a lot of scientists and access for a lot more scientists. We have campuses at Darsbury and the Rutherford Appleton Lab in Harwell. We have globally recognised research capabilities and we try to inspire young people to get into science and technology. So within the scientific computing department, we've got almost 200 staff with computational scientists, developers, sysadmins, support staff, everything we need to do a good job really. We provide large-scale HPC facilities, lots of data services and infrastructure for doing science. We have four divisions and a partnership, sort of, within the department. So we've got the applications division, which is developing software for computational science. We've got the data division, which is how we store and access data. We've got the systems division, which provides infrastructure for doing science. Then we've got the technology division, which is largely focused on optimising programs, software, hardware, to make it as efficient as possible. Then we've got the Hartree Centre, which is a commercial outreach type of thing, which is helping businesses and other communities use the infrastructure we provide. So I work in the systems division, specifically in the petascale computing and storage group. So within that, the main purpose of that is the LHC tier one centre. So we provide storage for LHC data and we provide batch processing. We've got a high performance systems group, which is mostly focused around supercomputers which sits up at the, mostly at the Darsbury lab. They have Blue Wonder, Blue Jewel, and support of a couple of other supercomputers. Then we've got the Research Infrastructure Group at Rutherford, which provides infrastructure for EGI, for the Jasmine Superdata Cluster, various other research projects within the UK. So the cloud project, initially it started about three years ago using Stratus Lab and some old hardware, as many cloud projects do. It was quick to get it going initially, but there were problems. It wasn't as stable as we liked, and it was hard to upgrade and customise. Most of the work was done by graduates, so you had a burst of activity, and then a point where the new graduate caught up, then a burst of activity didn't work well, but it got us something that proved that it was something we needed. Then we got funding, we got new staff members, and we've got the team up and running with Open Nebula now. So the use cases we aim to address with our cloud, so we want self-service VMs, that's mostly for internal development. So people can test and develop code faster so they can get it ready for production sooner. We're hoping that at some point we'll have it stable enough for production workloads. So when we talk production here, we mean that 
we've got everything in place around the cloud to support it as a production service. So monitoring, logging, on-call infrastructure, everything we need to run 24-7 with a service. Then we want to be able to cloud, we want to be able to burst our batch form into our cloud. So, and potentially vice versa, as and when the need arises. So we want to be able to run jobs from our HT Condor system, running LHC batch jobs on our cloud. Then we have a number of experiments and communities internally within the STFC and a few externally that we're working with to try and get them running on our cloud. So the setup we have, we've got four racks of hardware. This is laid out in different aisles in the data center in two pairs. Each pair is 14 hypervisors, 15 storage nodes, giving us just under 1,000 cores, 3.5 terabytes of RAM, and a good chunk of data storage. We're currently running up in Nebula 4.10 with, on Scientific Linux with Ceph Giant. It's all connected by 10 gig Ethernet, and we've got a highly available database cluster, fully open Nebula database. We've got another dev cluster, Open Nebula dev cluster, for developing and getting all the use cases ready. So the self-service VMs, this is active now. We've got users using it, about 80 users registered and using it at the moment to speed up development and really speed up the workflows within the department. So. To get this running how we want it, we've created a simplified web interface that sits on top of Open Nebula users' the XML RPC interface. I'll speak a bit more about that in a bit. VMs, users log in using their corporate federal ID, which is essentially LDAP, and we replicate that within the VMs so users can log in that way as well. The cloud batch form, so at present, in the standard model, you've got a cloud, which has got some hardware, and you've got your batch form, which has got some hardware. In an ideal scenario, that would be the same hardware, and you'd just partition it as needed when you need it. So you'd end up with completely dynamic. So sometimes you've got more batch running, sometimes more cloud. We've done a lot of work getting the first part of it working, getting the batch system bursting into the cloud. So we have the rooster daemon in HT Condor, which launches VMs. They talk to our configuration management system to get the right configuration. Then they start running jobs as slowly with physical worker nodes. There's lots of presentations being done by my colleague Andrew Laheef at CHEP, and if you search, there's lots of other conferences as well. So then we've got the experiments and the communities that we're working with. So most of the experiments and communities want a combination of work running on a cloud plus interactive machines. So they, ha they want things like build nodes for running Jenkins on. They want batch nodes for doing batch processing, and they want development machines that their devs can use to test code. Once we're happy with the network isolation and getting the service production ready, then we'll get external communities on board as well. So because of the organization we're in and the network we're on, there's a lot of restrictions on what VMs have to do. So they've got to be up to date. So we enable auto updates by default, all of the VMs report into our Pikiti server. So if we find that one is not updating properly, we know. They all must log to central loggers and the administrators of the cloud need to be able to log in either by public key or password. So we can go in and check what a VM's doing if it's just some services died or whatever. So their defaults in all of our images any VMs which don't comply with this, we kill. So what do we need to make the cloud work really well for us? So we need network isolation. We need 
to be able to isolate the internal traffic of the tier one from the other communities that are using it. It's not something we've got in place at the moment, but it's a big thing we need to work on. We need traceability, so we need to know exactly what's going on within each of the VMs in the cloud. And we need federated identity management. So we need users from different communities to be able to log in with the credentials they usually use to our cloud. It's not something that we can do easily at the moment, but it's something we're looking to add. So starting with the traceability, as I said, we need to know exactly what's going on in a VM at any given time, and we need to be able to find out historically what's happened in it. So there's two real approaches to take to this. We can do NetFlow monitoring. Setting up the monitoring is easy. Analyzing the data that comes out of it is really not. And we can make a copy of the machine at the end of their lives. So to begin with, we, made a, we make a copy when a machine is deleted. To get what we want, we really need both. So there's some work to be done there. So, Follow traceability in 4.10, which we were in our production cluster. When the machine is shut down, the image is saved because when it enters the running state, we create a deferred snapshot of all of the disks that belong to that VM. Then we've got a cron on our head node, which cleans up images once they're old enough and they fit the right criteria. The custom web front end that we've got doesn't allow deletion. It only allows users to shut down. So a limitation of this, using the deferred snapshot is not ideal because it means we can't take additional snapshots of the VMs while we're running. And I'm not entirely certain it's actually possible in 4.14. I haven't been able to find the right call to make it work now. There's better ways we could do it. And actually, after the hack session yesterday, an even better way came out, which is looking promising in rewriting the transfer manager to do what we need it to do. So that's probably the route we're going to go down for that while we continue to look at getting the NetFlow monitoring up and running. So one of the other things we've, had, we've done is we've integrated the cloud with our config configuration management system. That's Quato with Aqualon. So all of the infrastructure in the Open Nebula cloud is configured using Quato. Our scientific limit Linux images are built using Quato personalities. Then the ones for users which don't interact with Quato have the components stripped out of them. When VMs are deleted, it resets that host in Aqualon to its default personality. So it doesn't have any configuration applied to it. So in addition to that, we've also written hooks for the creation of machines. So when a VM is created, if it's got the right custom variables in its template, we'll get a personality sandbox or an archetype assigned to it. The advantage of this is then when the VM boots, it gets all the right configuration from boot time. So in the future, we'll surface those custom variables through the web front end so that users can just select what template, what personality that they want at instantiation time. So as I said, we've created a custom web front end. It's designed to be very simple, not just because users are users and they like it to be as easy as possible. We wanted it to be as few clicks as possible to get the VM up and running. And we want to, to severely limit the ones who have a tendency to poke around and try and do things they shouldn't from creating huge VMs constantly. So it's been developed with, it was originally developed for Stratus Labs. Then we've put up a Nebula as a new backend to it. And in theory, it should be relatively easy to add support for other clouds, should we want to. So this is an idea of what the front end looks like. So you've got a list of VMs, you've got to create machine button, no VNC, and get rid of the VM. 
So it's very simple. There's not a lot they can do. Anybody can use it. There's a full walkthrough at the end of the slides, but I'm not sure I'll have time to actually go through that. So the web front end, upcoming features that we're in the process of adding. So adding interaction with Aqualon, as I said, surfacing the variables to the users when they create the machine. The ability to attach additional disks, which is something that we, we get a few users asked for, but a lot of users don't know they can ask us for it. So we think it's a desired feature. The ability to resize VMs. So at the moment, everybody gets a VM, which is one core and four gigabyte. If they want more, then they can contact us and ask, but again, a lot don't. And then we've got various additional usability tweaks. It's on GitHub if you want to have a look at what we've got in the pipeline, if you want to try it for yourself. It should work on pretty much any standard open nebula. Alvaro put over at UGEN has managed to get one up and running. So some issues that we've had. Traceability has been one of the biggest issues that we've had. Getting it working how we want and getting it so that it doesn't interfere with regular use. And the other big issue that we've got at the moment is we've just had to replace our Ceph monitors. So as in line with our corporate policy, we gave them new host names because they're new machines. But all of the VMs that were created before we updated the data store still look to the old monitors for their connection. So we have a hack to get around it, but doesn't always work and it's not a great way of doing it. So if anybody has any ideas on a better way of doing it, I'd love to hear them. So what's next for us? Next is a lot of upgrades. So getting Open Nebula up to 4.14, getting Ceph up to Hammer, getting all of the underlying infrastructure up to SL7 so that when Infernalis comes out, we can get up to that as well. Getting the network isolation. This is a big piece which is coming up. We need to have a lot of meetings with our internal networking team and security teams to figure out how best to handle this. We know there's a lot of functionality in Open Nebula for doing it, but we need to know what we need to achieve, really. And federated identity management. We've got a lot of communities need their way of logging into the service. So we need to provide that. So, any questions? Uh, Alex, uh, well, <laughs> we have tried your front end that is very nice and yeah. simple to use for the user. And it's asking for a user and password using an app. But do you have any other authentication mechanism uh, to allow, for example, a user to do it uh, X509? certificate or could be uh, ticket to access with any kind of user password? So at the moment, it only accepts username and password combinations. Layers get passed to Open Nebula, which then does the authentication. It would probably be relatively straightforward to add X509 authentication to it. Raise an issue against the GitHub. Um, OK, <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank you. Any of us? I, I would suggest you, you do not upgrade to Infernalis after Hammer, but you wait for Jewel, the next version. OK. Well, because, the, because Ceph has these odd version numbers, which are uh, not as well supported as the others. So Hammer is long-term stable. Jewel will be also. But Infernalis is going to be uh, retired when Jewel is published. So you can skip. Uh, you can hop from one long-term stable to the other instead of, yeah. OK. We'll bear that in mind. Anyone else? Thank you very much. <laughs>